And so last time we had talked about the fact that light behaves as a particle in the sense that its energy is quantized. Okay, but it also has the familiar wave properties that were actually well known even in the time of Newton. Okay, so however, still has wave like interference. And just as one example of that, right, so if you have a, oops, if you have a, why won't my computer talk to me? If you have a light source, okay, and you have some screen with some slits in it, this is the classic interference expect, experiment, and you have some other screen here, that's the detector screen. So this is a screen with holes, okay, and then, you send in, say, some red light. Okay, some of it makes it through the holes. And then on the detector screen, you get an interference pattern, which might look, depending on the relative size of the, uh, of the slit holes and the distance between them and the wavelength of the light, might be something like this, but it has, the important thing is just that it has interference peaks and valleys. So the interference can be constructive and destructive. Okay, now classically, when we do this, we say that the intensity of the light, which is what's measured by the detector, is proportional to, as you learn in your ENM class, the pointing vector, which is proportional to E cross B. The magnetic field for a wave is proportional to the electric field for a wave. And so this is really just proportional to the electric field magnitude squared. But in quantum mechanics, the same thing occurs, but our interpretation is a little bit different we say that this is proportional to the square, not of the electric field, but of a value psi. So psi is a probability amplitude rather than being an electric field. The fact that it's an amplitude is just a fancy way of saying that to get the probability density, you square it. You take this, the complex square. So this thing is complex, whereas electric fields are always real. Okay. All right, so now if, if light can have both particle and wave-like properties, it's naturally to ask if things that we normally think of as particles can also behave like waves. So conversely, oops, Do particles, like electrons, for example, behave like waves? And sometimes just asking a question like that is enough to get you uh, to become a legend. And that's what de Broglie did. And so he conjectured that this was true. And so let's just see how that ought to work by going back to what happened for light. So recall for light, we had the following formulas. Okay, so the energy is equal to h bar times omega. In other words, you can't just, if you have some light of angular frequency omega, you can't just have any energy you want. It's related to the energy in this way. Remember, this is a formula that was originally given by Planck. And then Einstein really sort of said that it's not just true for black body radiation, as Planck said, but true for every photon of light. 
Einstein also told us that the energy of a photon or any light-like particle is related to the momentum according to this. It's, the, it's momentum times the speed of light. So this is relativity. This isn't, by the way, historically how it went, but it's historically how it should have gone. And if you just use the properties of waves, then you can relate the angular frequency to the wavelength. This is equal to h bar times 2 pi the speed of the wave, which is the speed of light in vacuum C divided by lambda. And so now by comparing the bottom two, we get that the wavelength of light is equal to 2 pi h bar divided by the momentum. And so what de Broglie did was basically said, let's take that formula that's good for light and let's just assume that it's good for the other things like electrons too. And it turns out that's exactly correct. Okay, so that this was de Broglie's uh, proposal. And the only way to decide if something like that is true is to go out and do experiments. And the experiments weren't done until 1923 to 1928 by Davison and Germer. So the verification of this was Davison and Germer. Uh, these were experiments with nickel, I believe, crystal nickel from 1923 to 1928. And so here's a simplified cartoon of what their experiment looked like. Instead of having a light source, they have an electron beam. And their target, instead of being a screen with slits on it, is going to be a nickel crystal. And that's important just because the atoms are, uh, let me make them a little bigger. The atoms are sort of spaced regularly, more or less regularly. And so by scattering off of them, you can get an interference pattern. So you send in these electrons, you observe them at some angle that you can vary and that they did vary. And so here you have a detector. And so if the relationship between the atom spacing, the size of the atoms and the angle is all just right, you should expect to see an intensity pattern. And so that's exactly what they observed. And the typeset notes, I've got their actual data that I managed to dig up, but the cartoon version of it is, and they graphed it in lots of different ways, but if you graph as a function of the electron momentum, what's the intensity, which is actually something they measured by measuring a current, then it, it has peaks, oops, it has peaks and dips sort of like that at regular spacing. So there's, destruct, there's constructive and destructive interference. And so by doing this, they were able to establish that in fact, light, electrons really do behave like waves and they, and they behave just like de Broglie said they should. Okay, so as for, uh, as for photons, This is the square of some probability amplitude, but now for an electron, you don't really have the electric field that you can square. So you don't really have the classical interpretation, but the intensity in this case is, which is proportional to the probability of detecting an electron, is proportional to the wave function squared. So psi is something that has wave-like properties and has interference. Okay, and so this general idea, both for light and for electrons, is known as wave-particle duality. 
that under the right circumstances, you can observe interference, but you also observe the discrete nature of particles of both electrons and light. Okay, questions on that? No? Okay, so there's more in the notes. Uh, to do the homework, you're going to have to read the section on black body radiation that I put in there. I'm not actually going to go over that in class. Uh, we won't be able to go over everything that's in the notes in, in class, but uh, certainly to do the homework, you'll need to go over that. All right. Um, so from, from these sort of experiments and many others, uh, we now have a set of postulates for quantum mechanics. So from these and many other experiments. Have a set of postulates. Governing quantum mechanics. Okay, and so the first postulate is the following. that the state of a system, that is what there is to know about it, is represented by a ket, which I'm gonna write as psi like that, in a state space, A state space is a complex linear vector space with an inner product. Which is sometimes called a Hilbert space. Okay, so for example, consider a point particle moving in one dimension. Then classically, we would say that the state of the system is given by specifying its position and its momentum where it is and how fast it's going. As a function of time. But quantum mechanically, what this postulate is saying is the state is specified by this ket, which can be a function of time. Somebody say something so I make sure I haven't lost lost the internet. We're here. Great. Hi. Things are making sense. Hi. All right, good. All right, so postulate two. Says that physically measurable quantities. Uh, are called observables. That's just the definition. And they are represented by Hermitian operators acting on the state space or the Hilbert space. By the way, some books define a Hilbert space sort of more narrowly as something that has an infinite number of dimensions. We'll talk about what the dimension is in a little bit. Um, 
but I'm using, uh, I think, the physicist definition, where a Hilbert space is just any complex linear vector space with an inner product. OK, so there are four more postulates, but I'm not going to go over them now. Because first of all, we have to figure out these first two postulates by understanding all the things that are defined within them. So there are four more postulates. But first, those are in chapter three, along with these two. But however, first, we're going to go over the mathematical background the definitions and the theorems that we're going to need in order to efficiently deal with uh, with these postulates and understand these. OK. So we're going to start with a definition. We need to define what's a complex linear vector space. OK, complex linear vector space. It's a set of vectors with some properties. And by the way, vector is an exact synonym for ket. They're exactly the same thing. And we can call them, let's see, what should we call them? Let's call them V for vector. And we might give them labels one, two, three, et cetera. So they might look like this up to n. And they might go on forever, or they might not. But in any case, they have to satisfy the following properties. One is, if you add any two of them together, you should get another ket. So v1 plus v2 is also a ket. In other words, it's not possible to take a sum of two kets and get something that isn't a ket. And so this is called additive closure. Okay, the set is closed under addition. There is also multiplicative closure, which works in a subtly different way. But basically, if I take any complex number and multiply by a ket, Okay, that is also a cat. Okay, for C equals any complex number. If C is not zero, though, then we just decree that C times the cat is physically the same as the original ket. There's no way to tell them apart. There's no physical distinction. Okay, so that's going to be very important later on. We will often decide that we don't necessarily like uh, the, the normalization of the ket in some way. And so we're going to multiply it by a complex number. And we will do that with impunity knowing that it actually doesn't change what the ket represents as a physical system. OK. Postulate, this is really postulates three through six, or, or definition part of the definitions three through six. But I'm going to lump them all together and say that these things obey distributive associative and commutative properties. And since this is not a math class, I'm not going to belabor that too much. It's just the statement that everything you would naturally do with vectors, you can do with these vectors, uh, even though they're, they're complex. OK, so just for example, uh, the, the uh, commutative property of addition just says that if I have uh, v1, Oops. If I have v1 plus v2, 
that's exactly the same thing as V2 plus V1. In fact, you don't even really think about it. You can just rearrange things in the natural way like that. Okay, the fourth property that you have to have for it to be a complex linear vector space is that there has to be something called a null vector, which I'm going to write as null within this vertical line in the angle brace. This thing exists. Okay, and it has the property that if you take any vector, let me just call this one V, and you add the null vector to it, you get back the vector you got. So it's basically zero is what it is. It's also true that if you take the complex number zero, according to uh, part two here, and you act on a vector, you always get the null vector back. Okay. So if you think about this, you realize pretty quickly that writing the null vector is almost always a, a complete waste of time. It doesn't actually do anything for you because if you can write, for example, plus null in some equation, you could just as easily write nothing at all and it wouldn't hurt you in it. That's basically this statement right here. Okay, so you can basically just equ equate null with zero in every situation. And so from now on, we're never going to actually write it, but it's important to know that it can be there. So don't write null anymore. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a silly question. Are these capital or lowercase fees? Uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't necessarily matter. Um, I'm I'm thinking of them as capital. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, just curious. Right. So so in general it could be one or the other. Sometimes we won't uh, many times we won't be writing V, we'll be writing a Greek letter, we'll be writing just a number inside the inside the vertical line and the angle bracket. And so it just depends on the problem you're doing. Okay, good. Um, uh, okay, and property five is that every vector, I'm gonna just write psi here, the Greek letter psi, just to be different, has an additive inverse. which is unique. You don't have to worry about them be, there being more than one of them. And so I'm gonna violate my promise not to write null anymore. I'm gonna write it one more time and then never again. Psi plus the additive inverse of psi is equal to the null vector. And so instead of writing minus psi, which is the additive inverse, we could just write minus psi. It means the same thing. All right, so let's give some examples. I'm going to give very slightly different examples than what are actually in the typeset notes, just for variety. So example one might be you can take an ordered triple of complex numbers that I'm writing as z1, z2, z3. Notice here I'm not using the ket notation. I'm just writing it as an ordered triple, but this, uh, where these are complex numbers. It's important that they be complex because we had this closure property that said we are allowed to multiply this thing by a complex number. And so we can't just say, oh, z1, z2, z3 are the real, are real numbers. We have to be, we have to be allowed to let them be complex. Okay, example two is just to illustrate that we don't have to actually write them as an ordered triple. We could write them, say, like this. This is something we won't normally do, but we could do. Okay, we could write them as a two by two matrix. 
And again, these have to be complex numbers because of the closure property of multiplication. Okay, example three. Example three would be, let's say we take all linear combinations. We know we're allowed to multiply and add these things. So that makes sense to take linear combinations of two cats that I'm gonna call plus and minus. Okay, so the plus and minus are just labels for these things. So any linear combination of these would be some complex number C1 times the cat plus, plus a different complex number times the cat minus. Okay, and this is a good example because it turns out this is the state space for a spin one half system. That is for a particle that has spin, but where we don't worry about, about its position at all. Okay, example four. Again, these are slightly different from the ones in the text. Would be, let's define three cats, one, zero, and minus one, and all linear combinations of them. In fact, all complex, has to be complex, linear combinations. So one of the reasons I'm choosing this example is I want to emphasize that I've called one of these cat zero, but this is not the null cat. So in equations, when we mean the null cat, we're really just gonna write nothing at all. It, and so it's gonna be many situations where we'll have a cat labeled by the number zero, but it's not, you have to make sure you understand it's not the null cat. So this is the state space for a massive spin one particle. A massless spin one particle is actually has a different state space. Okay, let's do example five. Example five is going to be the cats zero, one, two, n for an integer n forever and ever. So n equals integer. And this turns out to be the state space among other things, for the harmonic oscillator in one dimension. So we don't know that yet, but we will. We will prove that. And now let's do an example six. So example six might be, um, all complex functions let's call them f of x on an interval let's take it zero less than or equal to x less than or equal to l and just for fun let's impose a boundary condition that f of zero and f of l are both zero Okay, so some of these examples are written in, in ket language, three, four, and five were written in ket language. Examples one, two, and six were just sort of written as objects that you can manipulate. But if you want to, you can go through all the things in the definition of a complex vector space and show that in fact, uh, everything is satisfied and this all works. Okay. So that's the definition of a complex linear vector space. Now we can talk about linear independence. So let's say you have a set of vectors. I'm gonna call them psi. I'm gonna put a subscript J that's labeling them. 
So j can be one, two, up to some integer n. These are defined to be linearly independent. If the following is true, that if you take their sum weighted by some complex coefficients that I'm going to call C sub J, okay, that's a ket for sure. If that's equal to the null cat, which I'm just writing as zero, then that requires all of the coefficients to be zero. Okay, if, if this is only true, if this equation is only true, if all the coefficients are zero, then they're linearly independent. If you can find an example of coefficients that makes this zero uh, without being all zero, without the coefficients being all zero, then they are linearly dependent. So otherwise, linearly dependent. So another way of saying this is if they're linearly independent, you can't write any of them as a linear combination of the others. Because if you could, you could take the yellow highlighted equation and just move one of the combinations, one of the kets to the other side, and you would have written it as a linear combination of the other kets. Okay, so now a definition. So a vector space, we can define its dimension uh, by asking how many linearly independent vectors it has. A vector space has dimension, let's call it capital N. If it has, at most, in linearly independent vectors. In other words, you can find n of them, but you, if you tried to add another one, they wouldn't be linearly independent anymore. Okay, and so now let's suppose we have a vector space and we know its dimension let's say it's capital N. Another definition we can make is that of a basis. A basis is a set of N, that's the dimension, linearly independent. Vectors. for our n-dimensional vector space. In other words, the first, the definition right above it just says you can find these vectors. And then if you have, then this definition says that we call that a basis. Uh, just spell this. This is not unique uh, as long as the vector space has greater than or equal to two dimensions, which it always will for us. And so a, an important problem that we will meet often and will have great importance for us is we often want to change the choice of basis. So a problem might be given to you or, or posed to you with one choice of basis and you find out that in order, to, uh, in order to solve the problem, it's better to use a different basis. Or it's maybe just easier to understand the answer that you've got 
by going to a different basis. And so this is a very common situation that arises. Excuse me, Professor? Yes, go ahead. Could you please elaborate again? What exactly do you mean by not unique for n larger than or equal to two? Uh, it just means that if I, if I hand you a vector space and say, find a basis, uh, all, all 11 of you might come up with different answers. So in order to get a unique answer, I might have to tell you, uh, well, in general, there isn't a unique answer, right? I, I have to expect that if I give you a vector space, you might, uh, you might all find different bases for it. And each one of you is correct. There's no right basis or wrong basis according to anything we've said so far. So later on, we'll talk about bases that have specific properties that we want the basis to have. And that will narrow things down and allow us to say, OK, this is the right basis for this problem. OK? Good. OK, so just by way of, of the examples that we've gone over, we can now uh, say what their dimensions are. So example one has dimension three because it was an ordered triple. Two has dimension four. Basically, it consisted of four independent numbers, z1, z2, z3, z4. Example three had dimension two. And in fact, let's go back up to example three. The basis there was just uh, plus and minus. That was our basis, the, those two vectors. It had dimension two, and that, that's a natural basis, but I could take, I could find other bases, is what the non uniqueness says. Uh, similarly, example four here, those are, the, those are the three basis vectors. Okay, so uh, example four has dimension um, three. Example five has dimension. infinity, because if we go back here, uh, here they are, right? They keep going forever for all any n integers. And so this has, there's no getting around it. You, you can't write any one of those as a linear combination of the others just by the way it's set up. And so the dimension is infinity. But it's infinity that is countable. countable uh, and discrete, meaning it's just in one-to-one -one correspondence with the integers rather than being a continuous infinity. And that's in fact example six. Example six has dimension infinity, but it's uncountable and continuous. So just to go back through example six, it was all complex functions. I can't, I can't take complex functions and put them into one-to-one -one correspondence with integers because these are continuous functions and I can have them wiggle it at, at, in any place I want. And so that's why it's called uncountable. Now, from the point of view of the complex linear vector space, as we've defined it so far, it, looks like we have two different kinds of infinite dimensional vector spaces. It turns out that in physics, technically, it's always going to be countable. But it's also going to turn out that there will be situations. This isn't going to be clear yet, but it will be later. There are going to be situations where it's convenient to pretend that our, our state space is uncountable. So we're not going to dismiss this, even though this is not physically realized in the real world, um, because it will turn out it's, it's a very convenient fiction to pretend that our state space can be uncountable or continuous. We will have to see, we'll have to see later how that works. OK, other questions? I have a quick question, Professor. Sure. Um, so like the situation of a three particle, for example, right, would have a continuous 
distribution. So like, how, how is, is that not a physical, uh, I was just curious on how that would relate to what you said. Uh, that, so that's, a, that's exactly what we're gonna discover a little bit later on. We have, to, we have to develop a little bit more math machinery, but basically the free particle that we like to think of as a continuous uncountable vector space is actually physically, that those are not physical states. That, uh, it turns out. Those are idealized, idealizations of physical states that you're used to with a continuous momentum. Uh, and so it's very convenient. We'll, we'll treat it as if it's continuous all the time, but technically speaking, those are not physical states. That's correct. Good. Thank you very much. Right. It's, it's so convenient to pretend that they're uncountable and continuous that that's what everybody does and that's what we'll do. Um, but you have to be aware that technically those are not physical states. We'll, we'll get into, into that in more detail later. Okay, um, so now let's say we have a basis. I'm varying my notation a lot just for, just to show you different notations that might occur. So my basis might look like this, phi sub j, where j is some label. And so let's say that's my basis. Any vector can be uniquely written as a linear combination of basis elements. Uniquely. And so I can write, let's say I have a vector V. That says I can write them as a sum from J equals one up to N. I'm gonna pretend for the moment that the vector space has a finite dimension N of some complex numbers I'm gonna call little v sub J times my basis elements, phi sub J. Uniquely means that the v sub j are unique numbers. Once I've decided on my basis and I've decided on my vector v, that decides what the v sub j are. These are called the components of the vector v in that basis. Now, if I choose my vector v, and I decide to change my basis, which I can always do because the basis is not unique, then the components will change. And the way you should think about that is, the, is this V here, oops, that's not what I meant to do. This V here is something that has a unique physical meaning. Like if for an ordinary vector, this might be the vector from the Cobb towards Rockford, right? That's a uniquely defined vector, but the components, the V sub J depend on my choice of basis and they will uniquely, they will change in all kinds of different ways. I could rotate my coordinate system and then the components will change, but the vector itself stays the same. Okay. So just things to remember, the components, of a given V and a given basis, if you've specified both of them, are unique. So the, I have to, you have to say what the vectors are, what the basis kets are, these are unique. Once you've decided those two things. And then another property is that if I take, let's say, a complex number A times V plus a complex number B times W, those are two vectors, that's equal to the sum from J equals one to N of A times the components of V plus B times the components of W. Okay, so now I've found the components of A, V plus B, W. All right, so 
One more definition for today, and then we'll, I think, be out of time. And that is we need to, we had this thing called an inner product that we need to define in order to help us understand the postulates. So the inner product of two kets, let's call them for the purposes of this definition, V and W, is denoted This, the left angle bracket, V, vertical line, W, right angle bracket, and this is a complex number. And it must obey the following rules. If it doesn't obey these rules, you don't have a, you don't have a complex vector space with an inner product. So one is that if you take V inner product W, you have to get the complex conjugate of W inner product V. A second rule that you have to obey is that if you take the inner product of a vector or a ket with itself, uh, that has to be oops, that has to be positive if v isn't null. And notice that it's also real. It's real according to number one here. And the third rule that it has to obey is it has to be bilinear, which means if I take the inner product of v with, let's say I do my a w plus b x. So I'm taking the linear combination of two kets. I'm interproducting them with v. This is just a ket. That's equal to a times inner product of v with w plus b times inner product of v with x. Okay, so we've now defined inner product. Uh, next time what we're going to do is we're going to define some other terms associated with inner products, namely uh, what, it, what are orthogonal vectors or orthogonal kets, what's an orthonormal basis, uh, and something called a dual vector space. And then we will uh, next time also talk about the Gram-Schmidt process, which is something you will need for your homework if you haven't noticed. So by the way, the homework assignment comes with a reading assignment, which includes, for example, as I've mentioned, the black body radiation section of the text, uh, which you will also need for the homework. All right, so that's it for today. And let me ask before you go if there are any questions. Okay. Professor? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so V has to be real, it can't be conjugate. Oh, I'm sorry, that I should clarify that. What I meant by what I meant had to be real is this inner product. Oh, not V itself, right? Not V itself, right. V V here is just a label for a cat. V, um, v inner product with V is a number. In general, an inner product can be uh can be um, complex, uh, that was this, but because VW has to be the complex conjugate of WV, if I take the inner product of something with itself, it has to be real. Can you repeat that last part again, please? So, so this uh, rule one here tells us that if you take, uh, let me just write it out just to be really clear. V with V is a real number. Oh, okay. Okay, and that follows from rule one. Good, other questions? All right, so if you, if you think of other questions again, you can always uh, send me email or you can um, ask for okay. office hours. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, so 
that 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 has to be the product has to be a real number for that to be conjugate. So it so the statement is that the inner product of any vector with itself has to be a real number. Oh, okay. 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 So that has nothing to do with that other part being conjugate. That's just a general rule. Well, no, it, it follows from this because suppose I plug in W equals V. Okay, okay. so, so if, I, if here, if I plug in W equals V, then I get V inner product V equals complex conjugate of V inner product V. And oh. that, that implies that V inner product V is a real number. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, then I will see you all on Friday virtually. Have Thank a good you. one. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good one, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you so Friday. Much. Bye. See you Friday.